me introduce Dr. David Noggle. He is Distinguished University Professor and Chair and Professor of Philosophy at Dallas Baptist University, where he has served in administrative and academic capacities for 25 years now. He has two earned doctorates, a PhD in Systematic Theology and a PhD in Humanities with concentrations in philosophy and English literature. Among his numerous publications are the books Reordered Love, Reordered Lives, Learning the Deep Meaning of Happiness, published by er Erdmans in 2008, and Philosophy, a Student's Guide, published by Crossway in 2012. But it was his 2002 Worldview, the History of a Concept, also published by Erdmans. That's the primary reason I wanted to have him come and share with us in both an academic Forum and the Religion and World View class uh, that I'm teaching currently. I could say much more about Dr. Noggle by way of introduction, but I'll limit myself to two things. First, it was he who started and still directs the weekly DBU lecture series called the Friday Symposium, which I'm looking forward to going down and attending, as he said I'm very welcome to do. Second, he has a dog named Kuiper, <laughs> which I understand is because of fondness for the dog rather than for a low opinion of the Dutch polymath Abraham Kuiper. So without further ado, Dr. David Noggle. Thank you, Rob. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about uh, Kuiper. I'm, I'm supposed to be done by 10 after a 1, isn't that correct? Please. Okay, uh, we'll do our, as best we can. Uh, but uh, Kuiper actually has a birthday coming up, November the 8th, which was the same as the death day of the Dutch polymath Abraham Kuiper. And my book, Worldview History, not Worldview History of a Concept, uh, Reordered Love, Reordered Lives, uh, came out on November the 8th. So I think there's some coincidences there. Or providences, perhaps, I should say. A father and a son were walking together, or riding together in a truck, actually, one day, and the young son asked the father, he said, Dad, what is the uh, limit to your counting? And the father said, well, I really don't know. He said, what about you? And he said, well, it's 1,542. He goes, why did you stop there? The father said. And then the son said, well, that's when church let out. <laughs> so I guess he was bored. That's the point. Uh, I want to tell you about a guy named Alvin Plantinga. Uh, Alvin Plantinga is a probably one of the top Christian philosophers in the world. His uh, autobiography is in this book, uh, Philosophers Who Believe, which was edited by uh, Kelly James Clark. And I have it turned to the uh, Plantinga page. Uh, and he says, a Christian life partly lived. A Christian life partly lived. He tells his whole story. Now, this came out in 1993, so it's been out in a, for a while now. Uh, but in any case, he is one of the finest Christian philosophers, which happens to be my discipline, uh, that exists. And he's going to be in Waco, Texas at Baylor University later this week, November 6th through 8th, uh, 2014. So he's going to be talking about a variety of things. I decided to uh, look up uh, the uh, web address or the website for the Baylor Philosophy Department and see a little bit about uh, the presentation by Alvin Plantinga and it had this to say about him. Alvin Plantinga is well known for his arguments that religious belief does not need the support of arguments to be rational, to be justified, to be responsible, to be the object of knowledge. So he's kind of controversial as you might imagine in the scientific, especially philosophic world or in any other way epistemologically appropriate. However, in his relatively underground lecture notes, he has this article that he has written, two dozen or so, and that's in parentheses, theistic arguments. And he sketches two dozen or so theistic arguments that he finds quite promising. So not only does he have this view that there is no reason to defend with rational argumentation the uh, existence of God, and he's talking about the Christian God, obviously, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, but he also argues in an apologetic fashion the existence of God in two dozen or so arguments. By the way, I should say also that uh, Alvin Plantinga 
He's, a, he's pretty funny. Uh, and if you just read this essay by him on A Christian Life Partly Lived, uh, you'll pick up on his humor. And he has actually spoken at DBU uh, and at our home, which is in Duncanville, Texas here. And we also lived on uh, Camp Wisdom, as a matter of fact, for a while. My wife and I did. Uh, but in any case, keep continuing on with Alvin Plantinga. Many of these sketches have remained only in outlines for decades. Now the program for, philosophical the, the, for the philosoph philosophical study of religion at Baylor has gathered an international array of scholars, some of whom are mentioned in the notes that Plantinga mentioned, uh, to fill in some of the details and provide further evidence on this fascinating set of research projects. Well, in 1982, Alvin Plantinga left Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he had been teaching. Uh, and he moved to the University of Notre Dame. And at the University of Notre Dame, he was required to give an inaugural lecture. And he did. His inaugural lecture was published under the title, Advice to Christian Philosophers. His advice, which was quite controversial, still is, even perhaps more so today, was that Christian philosophers take seriously biblical teachings, doctrines, and assumptions uh, in their philosophizing. So don't do philosophy as a non-Christian would. But that's how he um, started his career at the University of Notre Dame, uh, by talking about advice to Christian philosophers. I am picking up on Alvin Plantinga today, and I'm going to offer you a piece of advice as general Christian thinkers, but from the gospel as a whole. It, go, it includes, but goes beyond uh, what Alvin Plantinga had to say. So advice to Christian thinkers from uh, the gospels will be my uh, topic. Uh, I'm also happy to say that uh, I didn't really use Alvin Plantinga. I've met him on a couple of occasions. Uh, and hosted him when he spoke at DBU, but um, for the most part, I don't really know him super well. But I did quote his advice to Christian philosophers in Worldview History of a Concept on page, let's see, uh, page 24, footnote six, number 62, if you'd like to check it out. 50% of this book, by the way, in Worldview History of a Concept, was a doctoral dissertation at the University of Texas at Arlington. And a fellow by the name of Ken Pike, I bet you've heard that name before around here, right? Was on my dissertation committee until ill health forced him to resign. And so he called me up on the phone, said, Dave, this is Ken Pike. I'm not sure I'm imitating him properly or not. But uh, it was very official and academic and professional and so forth. Uh, and he said, I'm not going to be able to be on your committee anymore. And I said, rats. And I had no idea I'd be coming to G-I-A-L to speak. Uh, in any case, uh, and Ken Pike also spoke at DBU on one occasion. And he told us about the emic etic distinction, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and he also taught, taught us how to translate a language lickety split really fast. Uh, that's what I remember about Ken Pike, actually. We shouldn't forget the big biblical story, which is the Christian Veltan Shaun. That's how I pronounce it, at least. The G being silent in Veltan Shaun. A worldview. It's creation, fall, and redemption. And if you can remember a check mark or the Nike swoosh, then you have the biblical story, the biblical worldview down. It's creation, the way things ought to be, fall, the way things are, broken, uh, fallen, and then there is redemption, which comes in two stages, the already but the not yet. So you have the big biblical picture, creation, fall, redemption. And so if you can remember a check mark or the Nike swoosh, you've got it. The creation story is found in Genesis one and two. That was my uh, email. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, the creation story is found not only in Genesis 1 and 2, but in many teachings uh, throughout the Old and the New Testament. 
But on the basis of the concept or the story of creation, we might ask this, these questions. How does one's academic discipline participate in the goodness of God's creation? What within your discipline is part of the very structure of God's very good creation? And what are the insights that secular scholarship uh, tracking tracks with the creational norms and the givens that are detailed uh, in Scripture. And here's one more question. If every course, maybe you don't have this problem around here, but I have this problem even with Christian students. If every course is an opportunity to know God better, why is it so often difficult to be motivated to learn and to study? If every class is an opportunity to get to know God better, to know God better. There is also the fall of humanity into sin. I like to illustrate that, by the way, with Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty is a parable about humanity. We sat on a wall, creation. We had a great fall, Genesis chapter 3. And we haven't been able to put ourselves back together again. All the king's horses and all the king's men have not been able to put Humpty Dumpty, us, back together again. Night, night. <laughs> so Humpty Dumpty actually ends in despair. Humpty Dumpty is there in a thousand bits and pieces. He was a fragile egg. Yeah, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And not too much like a Texican. <laughs> but in any case, here are some questions that you might ask yourself uh, in light of the fall, in light of the fact that we had a great fall. How has my discipline participated in the religious rebellion that we call the fall? How has the discipline that is my specialty become twisted by cultural idolatry? And what are the signs within a discipline of unhelpful developments? Moves which are dehumanizing or which contribute to a lack of human or creational flourishing. Uh, that can happen. And here's another question. Why are systemic evils, say in buying things like Christmas lights or heads of lettuce, uh, why are those things oftentimes so difficult to detect and to combat? But that's um, a couple of questions there that might be of use to you on the uh, notion of the uh, redemption, or I mean, of the fall. Redemption comes in two stages. The Bible is about redemption. First Israel, then Jesus, then the church. So from Genesis 3.15 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 22, we have the story of redemption. And we might also ask, what and where are the healing paths that are evident within my discipline? That is, what are the helpful insights or contributions that especially the Christian faith can make to address the unhelpful or harmful developments within my discipline. So there is a redemptive dimension to our studies as well. How can the Christian faith offer much needed correctives to the discipline or offer new potential developments that move inquiry, which is what we're all about, uh, within the discipline? Uh, how can we, how does redemption help move it forward, our inquiry forward? in helpful or positive ways. How might Christ be at work through Christians and even through non-Christians as well? We do have common grace, as a matter of fact, uh, in terms of the renewal, the restoration, or the redemption of our disciplines. And another question. How would your particular Christian community function differently if shalom, or peace, or wholeness, well-being, were present in your Christian community? How would your Christian community, your particular Christian community, function differently if shalom were present there? Do I need this, by the way? I'm just gonna set it right there. So if you can remember a check mark, if you can remember, and you'll probably remember this, the Nike swoosh, then you can remember the biblical story, the Christian world view, the big picture. 
creation, fall, and redemption. Now, on the basis of this big story, we're going to have some traits, some characteristics of Christian thinkers, or of the Christian thinker from the gospel. And that's what I would like to talk about today. Thanks to Alvin Plantinga. This is some of my advice to you as Christian thinkers. First of all, we have the model of the incarnation. Since the eternal Son of God and the second person of the Trinity became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14, we have to rethink the nature, the content, and the practice of our studies and scholarship and our relationships with our colleagues and with our students. We pitch our tent. We dwell among them. Here's the way Eugene Peterson translated John 1.14 in his translation paraphrase called The Message, which you're probably familiar with. It says that Jesus bought a house, and Peterson says, and he moved into the neighborhood. And so that's what we have to do with our colleagues and with our students is move into their neighborhoods, so to speak. The earthly visitation of ultimate reality, true being, that sounds like a philosopher, doesn't it? In the person and work and life of Jesus uh, changes everything. And with all due respect to a country western artist named Faith Hill, a baby changes everything. Mm -hmm. That's Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said something very similar. He recognized, the, Dietrich Bonhoeffer did recognize the implications of Jesus coming on the discipline of philosophy, which is what he actually studied when he was uh, in graduate school. He promulgated the Christological redescription of philosophy as a result. For Bonhoeffer, Christian philosophy, or whatever the discipline might possibly be, whether it's mathematics or literature or anthropology or some linguistic study, aesthetics was constantly, and now I'm quoting Bonhoeffer here, a kind of theological thinking which was grounded in the primacy of revelation and shaped by receptivity to otherness. All disciplines, it seems to me, have to be rethought and perhaps retaught in light of the incarnation as the culmination of canonical Trinitarian theism, better known as a biblical worldview, creation, fall, redemption, which is symbolized by what? A Nike swoosh or a check mark. <clears throat> so we must move as a result of the incarnation uh, in a personal way into the neighborhoods of our students and of our colleagues as well in a figurative sense. My second piece of advice is this yeah, service. Thanks to Alvin Plantinga, Service becomes another characteristic of human beings in the service of God. It's a requirement. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. He says, I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. And thus I rejoice and share my joy with you all. In his own life, Jesus was a man for others. I'm using a Bonhoefferism once again. Christian thinkers, it seems to me, ought to be thinking on behalf of others. Jesus himself, our model, poured himself out like a drink offering first. This others first mentality fosters Christ likeness. It undermines self-service and self-promotion that so often constitute, in the academy at least, maybe it's different here at G-I-A-L, I don't know, but uh, sometimes there is in the academy a uh, tendency towards self-service and self-promotion. But not if you are serving others. Uh, it offsets that. A third piece of advice, cruciformity or crucifixion. It's not just service. 
but it's suffering and sacrifice as well. A call to Christian thinking is not only a means of serving others, but it just might entail a measure of suffering and sacrifice on students' behalf and on colleagues' behalf, the behalf of our colleagues as well. Crucifixion, actually. Christians, it says in Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke chapter 9, are to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. And no less is required of us as Christian scholars, teachers, thinkers, and researchers. What might a cruciform Christian thinker look like and mean? Here's some suggestions. It probably means disciplined work and rigorous study. It probably means and looks like taking a stand for truth, for goodness, and for beauty. It probably means and looks like being a public disciple of Jesus Christ. It probably means the cultivation of a genuine, and looks like the cultivation of a genuine humility as well. For Christian thinkers, it probably means and looks like choosing neglected or unpopular research topics that still may be of concern to Christian communities, though it may not be of concern to a professional scholarly type guild. It probably means and looks like basing, and this is Alvin Plantinga's primary point, our Christian scholarly work on countercultural Christian teachings. It probably means and looks like a genuine concern for classroom excellence. It probably means and looks like loving and forgiving colleagues. It probably means and looks like a genuine concern for students. It probably means and looks like studying theology, even if theology is not your discipline, but it means studying theology in depth. And it may mean and look like inglorious institutional affiliation inglorious institutional affiliation. Christian academics and thinking is not shaped by modernity. Although I am of the opinion that most academics are sh shaped by the paradigm of modernism, but rather Christian academics are sh to be shaped by the gospel, hence the title of my talk, which is advice uh, to Christian thinkers from the gospel. It surely means this, following a Jesus who humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, suffering and sacrifice. That was the bad news, I suppose. Here's the good news. My fourth piece of advice for Christian thinkers from the gospel is enlivened by Christ's resurrection. You know what sin did? It turned the world into a cosmic cemetery. And a lot of Christian thinkers and entire departments exude that exact death-like atmosphere. <laughs> There's no wonder, perhaps, that seminaries and cemeteries are oftentimes confused. <laughs> but Christ trampled down death by his own death and defeated it thoroughly by his resurrection. And this is our hope probably also why Jesus said in John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, uh, Jesus said to her, Martha, and I'm quoting here, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Then he asked Martha directly, do you believe this? Jesus' triumph inaugurated the kingdom of God. Jesus' triumph installed eternal life. Christian thinkers share in that victory, which is signaled by the resurrection. So fashionable pessimism, cynicism, and despair, which are, in my estimation, quite the contrary to faith, hope, and love. 
born of con and those are virtues that are born of Christ's conquest over all the malignant forces of evil in the world, the forces that turn the cosmos, the world as a whole, into a cosmic cemetery. And so a kind of genuine happiness, joy, and power, shorn clean of sentimentalism, ought to characterize the life and the labors of Christian thinkers. And this is in accordance with Christ's resurrection. So we have these words from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, God's might, which he brought about in Christ when he, God, raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He's praying for you, Christ's intercession. Fifth piece of advice here for Christian thinkers from the gospel as a whole. Again, thanks to Alvin Plantinga. Our efforts are encased in the intercessory prayers of Jesus. Jesus' ascension to the right hand, and by the way, C.S. Lewis is kind of funny about this one as well. I think it's in mere Christianity. Because of the images that it can conjure up in people's minds. But the ascension of Christ to God's right hand means many things biblically and theologically. Like victory, for example. But one of the most important is the role that he assumed as an advocate, as an intercessor for his people. And that includes us, his thinkers. To be sure, we need each other's prayers, so pray for one another. But it's encouraging to me, at least, and probably to you as well, and comforting to know that Jesus Christ is the one, and I'm reading here from Romans 8, verse 34, Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. So Jesus lived, Jesus was crucified, Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus ascended into heaven, he abides now at God's right hand and regularly intercedes on our behalf. I think we ought to be fortified by that fact that the ascended Christ supports our academic tasks in his very prayers. We ought to pray for one another. We ought to pray for our students. But Jesus ever lives to pray for us. Another piece of advice has to do, six piece actually, for Christian thinkers from the gospel it acknowledges and is subservient to Christ's lordship, to the lordship of Christ, to his cosmic rule and to his authority. In ascending to the right hand of God, Christ assumed all authority in heaven and on earth, according to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 18. You can also read about this in the book of Acts, chapter 2, 1 and 2. And though there are many kings and there are many lords, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. One day, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you probably know that uh, my thinking there is informed by Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. Christian thinkers ought to recognize and submit to the reality of Christ's lordship now, not just at some future point in time, but now. And this, not just in our teaching, but in all aspects of our lives, in all aspects of our thought, in all aspects of our practice, and not just by words alone. I'm reminded of what Proverbs chapter 29, verse 19 says, a slave, which we all are actually to Christ, will not be instructed by words alone. For though he understands, there will be no response. Dr. Abraham Kuyper, my dog's namesake, the man. 
he probably said it best. And this was when he was one of the founders of the Free University of Amsterdam. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out and say, mine. You've heard that before, right? Yeah. So a seventh piece, Pentecostal power. Seventh piece of advice from the gospel has to do with the Pentecostal power of the Holy Spirit. I call it Pentecostal power because it happened on the day of Pentecost, right? So it's Pentecostal power. Yet we often fail here. There are two central mistakes that the human race, regardless of the era, oftentimes make. Mistake number one, a radical quest for autonomy, independence. We want to be, do our own thing, let's say. And we also, therefore, and this is the second mistake, since we're not depending on God, we depend upon ourselves. That's mistake number two, self-dependence. Of course, if we seek to live independently of God and have nothing left to trust except ourselves and our own resources, we might remember this proverb, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 26, which says, He who trusts in himself, in his own heart, is a fool. But he who walks wisely, and I'm taking that to mean in this case, in submission to God, in submission to the Holy Spirit, will be delivered. But this quest for a complete self-sufficiency may explain the rise of humanism, rationalism, empiricism, scientism, technologism, and economism. And you'll notice each one of those words has an ISM, and that makes them into an idol. They're good things, uh, but they can be abused and misused. And those things, though, have arisen in the last few centuries. Chances are high it's because we are autonomous creatures depending upon ourselves. We don't depend upon the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, Christ's followers, including those like us of the academic clan, have been given the gifts of the guidance and strength, the comfort and the courage and the grace and truth born of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised upon his departure that he would not leave his disciples as orphans, but he would come to them in the person and in the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is in the upper room discourse with which I'm sure you're familiar in John chapter 14 <laughs> through chapter 16. And he fulfilled that promise of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. And that's why I call it Pentecostal power. Hence, since that day, the Holy Spirit has been giving gifts to the members of the body of Christ, to us, and fulfilling multiple promises, enabling those promises to be fulfilled, including the significant ones of helping his disciples, which would include us, to recall Christ's teachings and guiding them in regard to his truth. This is a, and I'm going to use some fancy terms here, pneumatological benefaction, a Holy Spirit blessing. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, by the way, this pneumatological benefaction should give us an academic edge. <laughs> but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to Duncanville, Texas. No, it doesn't really say that, but you get the point. To the remotest part of the earth. Guess what? There's a coming judgment. This is my eighth and final, you'll be happy to know, piece of advice for Christian thinkers from the Gospels. Again, thanks to Dr. Alvin Plantinga. He reminds Christians of an academic vocation that we will one day be judged. The Gospel does, actually. And our judgment will come based on either our fidelity or our infidelity to the Christian, to the way in which we conducted our callings as Christian scholars, teachers, thinkers, and researchers. 
summing up many biblical texts. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We have the Nicene Creed, which states forthrightly that Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Of course, those serious about honoring Christ in their scholarship as a Christian thinker on the basis of the gospel will desire to sincerely affirm the following along with the Apostle Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And that's from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and the first part of verse 8. So on this final examination day, and that's what it is, prepare for your finals. You want to be able to hold your head up high. You want to be able to look him in the eye because you sang his song on the shores of Babylon, the fall the fallen world. That is, unless and unlike you are Daniel the prophet uh, and you have attended Babylonian you or perhaps American you. I didn't say DBU, by the way. So in reverse order, here's what we have. We have some advice for Christian thinkers from the gospel in reverse order. If we remember the fact that there is a coming judgment, but we are endowed with Pentecost, Pentecostal power, uh, that there is a intercession on Jesus on our part, on Jesus' does it on our part, uh, there is a resurrection. He endows us with that. He is Lord of all, that there is cruciformity, there is service, and there is incarnation. Would you like to listen to a song? I brought along a song with me. But I think I'm going to have to turn all this on again.
more meaning to those lyrics than you realize, right? And on, let these words sink deeply into your heart. And on the final day I die, I want to hold my head up high. I want to tell you that I tried to live it like a song. And when I reach the other side, I want to look you in the eye and know that I've arrived in a world where I belong. Until then, sing his songs on the shores of Babylon. This is my advice to Christian thinkers from the Gospels. Thank you. <clears throat>